Hello, everybody. Uh, this is Anthony Eggert, I'm the director of the UC Davis uh, Policy Institute, and welcome to today's webinar on the effects of climate change on inland fishes of California. Uh, the Policy Institute is a, a relatively new initiative of the uh, UC Davis system um, to leverage world-class research to, and to deliver that to the policy-making process and policy discussions to inform better energy and environmental policy. Um, we're very happy to be uh, today partnering with one of our, our key partners on the campus, the Center for Watershed Science, um, to, to talk to this subject. Uh, I'd like to introduce the, the two speakers. Uh, we have uh, Professor Peter Moyle, uh, who is a Department of the Fish, Wildlife, Fish, and Conservation Biology Department here at UC Davis and is also the Associate Director of the Center for Watershed Sciences. He's been working on uh, these issues related to fish and native fish in California, California's freshwater system for over four decades. Uh, he's authored uh, many, many books, over 200 peer-reviewed uh, papers uh, on these subjects, and uh, we're very, very fortunate to have him here. Um, our next speaker is uh, Becca uh, Quinones. Um, she is a postdoc researcher here at UC, UC Davis, also working in the Center for Watershed Sciences, and she was uh, one of the key uh, scientists and contributors to this, to this study. And so we're going to go ahead and kick it off with, uh, with Becca. Hello. So first let me define what we mean by inland fishes. And here what we're considering are fishes that use fresh water for at least some part of their lives. So depending on the study that we highlight, we're going to have to specify what that means as far as the number of species we consider because we've gone from about 122 species to now 133 species that we're considering. So just keep that in the back of your mind. And for today's talk, we really have three primary goals. We want to look at uh, the predicted effects of climate change in aquatic habitats in California. And this is going to be a, a fairly quick review of the primary effects that we think about. Um, then we're going to uh, touch on the climate change threats to native fishes. And then we want to leave with a, a positive note, um, just detailing some of the things that we are pushing forward as far as conservation strategies. So what can we do? When we think about the predicted effects of um, climate change on aquatic ecosystems, we're really talking about four primary effects. And these are uh, sea level rise, changes in precipitation, particularly the ratio of snow versus rain, uh, increases in water temperatures, and increases in droughts and floods. And there are many other effects that we can talk, but these are the ones that we're going to touch on, on this, in this particular presentation. So let's start with sea level rise. The latest models predict somewhere between 1.4 and 1.7 meters of rise by 2100. And what we're finding is, as new models come out um, is from one year to the next, are that the predictions are actually much worse than we thought originally. So if we look at the predictions two years ago, we were looking at a 1.1 meter rise, and now we're predicting up to a 1.7 meter rise. And that'll differ by location in California, Southern California, will probably have um, a higher rate of uh, sea level rise due to uh, land subsidence. So that you also have to consider there's some local effects associated with all of these predicted effects. And so that sea level rise coupled with more extreme tides, we're expecting will result in a loss of estuarine habitats. And we're looking at about a loss of 40% of mudflats, marshes. And these habitats will be particularly important to migratory fishes. So if you think of our of salmon and steelhead and sturgeon that migrate out to the ocean. These are habitats that they use um, significantly, particularly for rearing. Now talking about changes in precipitation, the model suggests that there's not going to be large changes in total annual precip precipitation. So we're looking at about 10 to 20 percent difference. But some models differ whether it's going to be slightly wetter or slightly drier. Um, again, the latest model suggests that things are going to be worse and much drier than, than we thought originally. We will still see this Mediterranean pattern of rainfall where we get most of our rain in the winter and spring, though not this year. Um, and the biggest changes with precipitation uh, are going to be that we're going to have that coming down much more as snow than rain. And particularly the, the hardest areas, the hardest hit areas will be those in mid elevations in the Sierra Nevada that will be in the 1,500 to 2,500 meter range. And if you look at elevations across the state of the um, mountains, the, you'll notice that the Cascades are lower in elevation than the Sierra Nevada. 
So you might actually see larger uh, changes in the northern part of the state. So paradoxically, because you would expect Southern California to be warmer, uh, that may not happen simply because it's the Sierra Nevada is a higher in elevation. But in total, we're looking at about 60 to 90 percent loss of snowpack in the Sierra Nevada. And this will have huge impacts on the amount of flows that we'll have in our streams, particularly the streams that depend on snowmelt um, to feed their flows. So what would that look like on stream flows? Well, we're going to expect that flows, flow patterns throughout the year will be much more variable than we're used to looking at. And that'll be expressed as higher, larger peak flows uh, that will happen earlier in the year. So instead of having peak flows perhaps in December, we might see that shifted to November. Um, also, on the other side of that, we'll have more pronounced droughts. So we'll have lower uh, base flows in the summer that will last for longer periods of time. So here's an example of what that might look like. He, this is a hydrograph, and a hydrograph depicts the pattern of flows uh, across a year of a particular stream. This is for the Salmon River. We have flows on the vertical axis and months on the uh, horizontal axis. And here I'm comparing what historical flows, what we would expect historically to happen in the river in the solid line, and how the predicted effects of climate change may shift those patterns in the dotted line. So this is assuming down below I put my assumptions from some of the studies that we looked at. If we uh, looked at a 10% increase in winter flows, 30% reduction in spring and summer flows, and a 30-day shift in peak flows to earlier. And so the take-home message here is that most of their fishes in California are spring spawners. So you can see if you look at the April, May, June, kind of March areas, there's just going to be less flows. So I'm looking at uh, historical flows decreasing to some hypothetical down here in that area, that, is, uh, that, that time of year, which is particularly important for spawning. So now let's talk about temperatures. Uh, something to keep in mind is that temperatures in California rivers often approach environmental tolerances already. So there are a lot of areas in California where fish are having to tough it out, particularly through the, through the summer. If we have a four to six degrees uh, Celsius increase in average air temperatures, we can expect a three to five degree increase in water temperatures. And that's based on some studies in the Sierra Nevada so that, um, that magnitude of rise in water temperature will also be location dependent. But regardless, what we could expect is that we'll have these uh, tolerances being exceeded. And so perhaps these lethal temperatures will, ca will happen more frequently. This is a picture of the um, fish kill that occurred in 2002 in the Klamath River, where flows, low flows, and high temperatures um, created the perfect storm for um, breakout of disease. And so in just a few days, we had more than 30,000 steelhead and salmon and green sturgeon and some other species uh, die because of this spread of disease and the conditions that are happening there. Now, that is an extreme event, but we can expect that these conditions will continue to worsen for fish as we move to, um, continue to feel these effects from climate change. So as far as what that means for the availability of suitable habitat, we can perhaps expect that 60 to 99 percent of the cold water habitats will disappear. And that means that these fish are going to be really hard hit at finding areas to weather out the um, warm temperatures. Um, some folks have estimated that some species could actually move northward or higher in elevations looking for cool water. The challenge for fishes in California is that most of our streams already have dams or are fragmented in habitat. Um, and so there's not uh, such an easy accessibility to new habitat for these fish to go to. Um, and so, in, in fact, we, we might expect is that we're going to see a shift in the assemblages that we have in streams where warmer temperatures will favor uh, non-native species um, and actually threaten the native species that we have. So I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Moyle to talk about the specific effects of climate change on native fish. Thanks, Becca. Um, so the climate change obviously is going to affect California streams and, and lakes in, in many, many dramatic ways. Um, and you would think that our native fishes would have a leg up here because they survived extreme conditions for tens of thousands of years, perhaps as much as a million years uh, would be uh, in isolation. So what's going to happen with our 
native fishes. Well, first off, I want to remind you that this is a California problem, that about 80% of our fish are found only in the California region. That is only in California or are shared with one other state. So we, our fauna is largely endemic. Um, and that means that if we lose the fish in California, they aren't going to be magically saved someplace else. So uh, the conservation is, an, is a major issue here. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, we've determined that 80 fish, 80% 80, 80 of our native fishes are in decline of one sort or, or another. Um, and this is from a study that Becca and I and Jacob Katz did and published in 2011. Uh, well, one thing to note here is that already a quarter of these fish are listed species by the, either the state or federal government. So this is not just something we're making up. Uh, it's very, uh, very real, and it's been recognized by the agencies. Um, and you can see this is what's, what's going on through the years. Um, this graph here is one that shows four different assessments of the fish fund of California that I've been involved with since 1975. Um, and the key things to look at here, you look at the number or percentage, rather, of listed species, and it's going up continuously uh, in this period of time from 1975 to 2010. And likewise, the species that are vulnerable, that it could become listed at some time in the near future, has been going up steadily. That's the yellow bar. So obviously, the fish spot in California is already uh, in decline. Um, and we know extinction happens. Uh, the thick-tailed chub is a species that was once one of the most abundant fish in Central California, a major food fish for the, uh, uh, for the Indians. Um, the last one was caught in 1957. Uh, the bull trout on the, the lower picture was, this is a picture of the last, one of the second to last fish that was caught. The very last one was caught by one of my graduate students in the mid 1970s. Uh, this is a species which is still present in Canada, but it's regarded as a threatened species in most of its range in North America, but it's extinct in California. It's, a, it's too bad to lose that beautiful fish. Um, well, the causes of these native fish declines are basically in two broad categories. You can break these up in all kinds of different ways, but uh, the key one is habitat loss and degradation. And that goes along with the fact we've changed the landscape so much. It's a, a picture uh, in the eggs, you see egg fields there, Peter Creek points through egg fields. That demonstrates how much the landscape has changed and the, the stream becomes a narrow ribbon of altered habitat going through these fields. We have dams and diversions in most of our uh, streams in California, uh, which continually alter things. And this is combined with the fact that we've also introduced a, many different species of alien fishes. Uh, and these alien fishes tend to thrive in environments that we've altered. So it's a one-two punch for the native fishes. You change the habitat, then you bring into other fishes that are a little bit better adapted for that changed habitat, and it makes it much harder for the native fishes to thrive. Um, and then, so climate change then becomes an additional stressor on all this. Um, we have. Um, we, we were involved, again, in a climate change vulnerability study sponsored by the California Landscape Conservation Cooperative, uh, which we evaluated the vulnerability to extinction of 121 native fishes and 43 alien fishes um, using a 100-tier time frame uh, as our frame of reference. This is basically what all the climate change models use as well. Um, and so we tried to make predictions to what's going to happen to these various species of native fishes over the next 100 year period. Uh, and our methods were based on the literature, basically. We, comp we have a very extensive file of the literature, We've, and I've written about most of these fishes at one time, so we compiled the literature and observations on all species. Then we had two sets of metrics we used. One with 10 metrics, which determined the baseline vulnerability to extinction, that is, um, how, how likely are these fish to go extinct even without climate change? And then another 10 me metrics that uh, are designed to measure how rapidly would these fish, are these fish likely to go extinct as a result of climate change? Uh, I don't want to get into the, the metrics of those methods. That's a whole other seminar. But uh, this, this, ha this study has been published, so you can read about it as well. But the key thing here is that 49% of our 121 native species we were able to evaluate are already critically or highly vulnerable to extinction, even without climate change. Uh, and 
all of our non-native species rated low uh, uh, in the same exercise. Uh, that suggests, obviously, that native species are not going to do very well and non-native species, alien species, will do a lot better. Uh, and you can see this in this graph here, which shows you climate change vulnerability as we measured on those 10 metrics just for climate change. The black bars show the native fishes, the paler bars, the gray bars show alien fishes. And what you see immediately the, on this, this um, Graph shows the number of tax, the number of species on the uh, uh, y-axis and the vulnerability uh, uh, ranges and scores on the x-axis. And what you see is that um, uh, roughly 100 species of the native fishes, that is 82% of our native fishes, are in serious trouble as a result of climate change. While, that, while some of the native species, about not, uh, sorry, while some of the alien species can be in trouble, by and large, the, most of the alien species are going to persist and do just fine. Um, so th in the bottom line here is that most native fishes face severe decline or extinction in the next 100 years if present trends continue, and alien fishes will become an increasingly dominant. But I'd like to emphasize that this is if present trends continue. Uh, there's a lot we can do. Um, and. Uh, uh, so the question and what is and what is it that we can do? And first off, I'd like to point everybody to this book published by the Public Policy Institute of California with a bunch of co-authors from the Center for Watershed Science called Managing California's Water from Conflict to Reconciliation. Um, if I do say so myself, it's a very readable um, summary of the problems. And uh, I would encourage people to use this as a basic reference to get acquainted with the complexity of California's water issues. So next, I'll turn it back to Becca again to talk about our straight, our proposed strategy. So what can we do? Um, there are two major goals that we have when we think about uh, strategies for conserving aquatic um, habitats in the state. And one of them is to try to protect all of the major habitats represented throughout the state, as well as uh, preserve areas that would um, result in self-sustaining populations of all native species. And what we've done is really built on this uh, five-tiered approach that's been proposed uh, by Peter for several years now. There's been many iterations of this five-tiered approach. Just recently, we updated it, and there is a publication that should be coming out this year um, through the Fishes in Mediterranean Environments journal. Um, but let me touch on some of the key ideas there. Basically, what we're trying to do is first compile all of the available information we have on fishes in California. And so to do that, there has been extensive work building of a database named PISES. Um, and many folks in the Watershed Sciences Center have been um, brought together to do that. Um, and the first thing that we are trying to do is to identify areas uh, and patterns of biodiversity across the state. So first, we would like to see where um, fishes are doing well and habitats are still intact as a way to protect uh, the best of what's left. Um, then we're trying to think about ways that we can manage habitats also to improve conditions. So looking at environmental flows below dams, uh, considering dam removal uh, also in some areas, um, looking at how to manage floodplains and the Yolo Bypass is uh, an area that there's been some active research. And then also kind of implementing the keystone ideas uh, associated with conciliation ecology. So let me touch on this Pisces database because we're encouraging folks that do work with fishes in California to supply information and use the database. This is a database that we want to make available um, because ultimately we would like to have one place where information of fish presence absence is available as well as things like the status. Right now we have all the status information in the database. We're putting in uh, climate information, uh, hydrology information, um, with the idea that you can go in and not only look at changes in fish distribution over time, but you can also look at threats to those species in specific areas. So how do we spatially reference the information that we already have? And that is available at a website, and the website, if I remember correctly, is pisces.watershed.edu, but I will look that up and make sure that it's true. So this first tier that we're looking at is protecting the best of what is left, and Peter, can you remind me what the pictures of, of uh, these here is? These are in Deer Mill Creek, Santa County. 
And so these are areas where uh, the habitats are fairly intact and fish are yeah, doing well. Yeah, uh, some of the few. <laughs> and so that would be our first goal, is to identify these areas for um, areas that could be protected. And I'll turn it over for, to Peter Purple Creek. Yeah, well, uh, one of the best examples we have today of protecting what the best of what's left is one that's an ongoing process right now. It's not finished yet, but this is a uh, cooperative project between the Western Rivers Conservancy and the Yurok Tribe. Um, uh, essentially, they're setting, Condu has set aside most of the Blue Creek watershed, which is a tributary to the Klamath that's in the Fog Belt, as a salmon sanctuary. Uh, it's a wonderful cooperation because uh, once the watershed is essentially uh, managed, set aside and managed for, for fish, um, it will uh, have, a, have a major impact on the runs even in the main stem Klamath River because this is a, a place that potentially can stay cool uh, even through fairly dry years. And, and best of all, the Yurok tribe has a commitment to manage it as a salmon sanctuary, so we have people in place to do the managing. Uh, another good example, of those, it's, it's more along the lines of restoration, uh, is in the Big Springs Creek in Shasta Valley. This is an example of a rare cold water source and big springs literally that pop out of the ground from taking uh, water from Mount Shasta it comes, comes out cold and clear and it was highly degraded from cattle grazing. The Nature Conservancy purchased the property uh, it was fenced and much more much more so than we had even expected recovered extraordinarily rapidly um, and uh, it, you now have a deep, much more defined channel in this area. Uh, the cows are no longer in it, grazing all the vegetation. There's lots of food in there, and the coho salmon, Chinook salmon, and um, steelhead are, are back in numbers. So it's, it's a very impressive recovery, and it's only going to get better. We now need to work on the rest of the Shasta River to try to make this uh, a true salmon sanctuary. Uh, Another thing that we've been working on is looking at environmental flows below dams. We know they work from our Puget Creek experience. Uh, this just shows you Folsom Dam, uh, the, including a recent photo of it being dry, uh, showing of what it looks like when it's full and it's dry. But this is a, an, an area that, that needs a lot of work, which is to figure out how can you improve environmental flows below dams for fish. Um, and Ted Granham is a postdoc at the Watershed Center is working on this. He's got an amazing database on 1,400 large dams in the state um, about the, with their characteristics uh, of flow and so forth. And he's winnowed down this database now to 200 candidate dams for which uh, environmental flows would likely have a large benefit. And this includes, uh, we have also have about 20 case histories we're working on in more detail. But this is an example of the kind of things we need to think about statewide because virtually every river of any consequence in the state has a dam on it and all the smaller ones do too, uh, the smaller dams. And we have legal tools to do this. I always like to remind people that we have a beautiful section 5937 of the California Fish and Game Code which actually says uh, that keeping fish in good condition should be a high priority for the water coming out of any dam. And this is related in turn to the public test doctrine. Uh, which came out of the Pub Mono Lake decision, a very ancient doctrine, that also um, it says it's, it's the obligation of, of state and federal governments to protect uh, fishes and aquatic life. And finally, of course, we have the Endangered Species Act, uh, which is everybody, the bane of everybody's existence in many respects, because by the time you have to apply the Endangered Species Act, the species are already in such trouble, they need all kinds of special attention and perhaps more water than they would if we've been paying attention to begin with. Uh, so Becca, did you want to talk about dam removal? Sure. Did she has a project going? On we, this? we approach dam removal um, pragmatically. We believe that although um, these are large concrete structures that really they do have some longevity uh, associated with them. That is to say that at some point um, most dams will lose or all dams will lose their function even if it's you know 100 or 200 years from now either because the reservoirs behind the dams get filled or because um, the, the structure itself starts to deteriorate. So we start to think about how do we begin to evaluate dam removal in the context of propelling uh, salmonic conservation in the state. 
And that was uh, largely driven because the idea that uh, most of the anadromous salmon habitat are above dams now. So if you look at 70% of the, the state of the habitat in the state is behind the dams. And so this map shows um, the extent of salmonid habitat where the blue is areas they can still access and the red is, are areas that are, they are no longer available to the salmon and steelhead because of dams. And what we did is that we um, took 24 case studies. Nine of them or eight of them were dams that have already been proposed for uh, removal. And the rest were ones that are barriers to some on it, but that we wanted to consider. And we put them um, through an evaluation and assessment where we looked at the characteristics of the salmon populations in these rivers. We looked at the quality of the existing habitat in the rivers, as well as uh, consider other stressors in the watershed to rate um, how much of a benefit dam, uh, dam removal would give um, salmon conservation in the state. And so stay tuned for the, that paper. It's, we're waiting for it to finish reviews. Well, and the other big activity that we can engage in in the short term is to manage floodplains. We've just begun to realize uh, the importance of floodplains to fish, uh, especially large artificial floodplains like the yellow bypass shown on this slide. Restoring these floodplains can be extraordinarily important, not only to salmon, but also the native fishes like split tail. We found in studies I've done on the Columbia's River, for example, that the native fishes know how to handle floodplains. They know how to get on them, how to spawn on them, and how to get out as they drain. Uh, so this has high potential. And right now, uh, it's a, um, also a good example of what we're calling, what is called reconciliation ecology, that trying to find ways to manage these floodplains, not only for fish, but also for wildlife, for farming and for their primary function, which is flood control. Uh, these things can all be compatible with, with negotiations, of course, but it is possible and not easy, but possible. And this gets us then into our final uh, concept here, which is reconciliation ecology, which is a basic approach to conservation. In a way, you could argue it's nothing new, but it's a way of looking at things that's really important. It says basically under the, uh, on, that humans dominate all ecosystems of the world, and especially it's true of aquatic systems. Um, and that's not going to go, that's not going to change. And it also means that most ecosystems are novel ecosystems to one way or another. Novel in the sense they've been highly altered by humans and they contain a lot of alien species. Uh, it's amazing how few freshwater habitats you find that don't have those characteristics. Um, and climate change then just increases the need for a reconciliation ecology approach where you recognize these, um, our, we have altered systems with lots of alien species in them. They're new systems that have never been grown before and they take a different kind of management uh, as a result. They need clear goals, for example. We need to know what species do we want to save because we, we probably can't save all species, unfortunately. But we can do, make a good effort to save most of them but it has to be in the context of how can we get these species to live in systems that we've altered and that contain a non-native species that they don't necessarily get along with. So in conclusion then, um, systematic actions are needed to save California's endemic aquatic species. We've talked about fishes, but there's clams and other organisms out there too. And being the eternal optimist, I think, I think we can do it. Um, I think there are lots of things that we can do. Um, likewise, uh, we had just have to recognize that climate change is accelerating these rates of decline uh, and that we need to get ahead of the game by starting to work on this. And I think the 2014 drought, our present drought, is a good time to start. It's telling us uh, what's going on, what's going to happen more and more in the future. And if we can survive this period, or rather if the, the native fishes can survive this 2014 drought, we, uh, we can have a, we should be able to devise better management plans for them. So at this stage, we'll be happy to ask, answer questions. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Peter and Becca. That was, that was fantastic. A, a tremendous amount of information, um, sort of spanning a lot of different <coughs> disciplines as well. Um, so we do have uh, time for questions. Uh, we would encourage uh, those who are listening in. Again, you have two different options. You can type into the 
uh, chat box, which is, uh, should be on your lower left corner of your screen. And there's also a uh, button that you can push to raise your hand if you'd like to ask a verbal question that's on the upper left hand of your screen. Um, and then if you do that, we can unmute you and recognize you for a question. Um, so I think maybe I'll, there, there was question, one question that came in during the talk, uh, and I'll start with that. Uh, you did touch on, on some of the points, but maybe to expand a bit, it says, can you explain a little more about the loss of estuary, estuarine habitats um, and the extent to which it's associated with the loss of water quality, vegetation, and other factors? I, I can start with that, and Rebecca can join in. We both worked on estuaries. I worked mainly on the Sisu Marsh in the um, San Francisco estuary. Rebecca's worked on some of the North Coast estuaries. Um, this is a, uh, an interesting question because the loss is, a, a, for, a lot, many, for a large part of it, it's just basic habitat loss. A lot of the est estuary habitat has been filled in, channelized, dike, drained, and so forth. Um, and so uh, you can argue that most uh, estuarine habitat has been lost in California. You look at the Delta, for example, which is 90, 95% uh, completely altered than what it was historically. So um, in, in almost every aspect of these estuaries have been changed. Uh, and water quality is an issue as well, especially in the uh, San Francisco estuary. So estuarine habitat for native fishes has been trained drastically. Also, awesome non-native oh. fishes involved as well. And to me, it's, I'm just continually amazed at how many native fishes are still making it, although, of course, surprising number of the fishes that use estuaries are also listed species. Becca, do you have anything you want to add? Um, sure. So that there was a, a question regarding the loss of water quality uh, in relation to the loss to water quality and vegetation. And really one of the key points here is that uh, not all the communities that we associate with healthy estuarine habitats are going to be able to keep up with the pace of change. And so that, a lot of the loss that we'll see is simply that, for instance, the submerged vegetation may not be able to, or emergent vegetation may not be able to move kind of upslope or inland um, as solidities change, for instance. Uh, but some of the things that we're trying to monitor are also things like algal blooms. Will we see algal blooms in areas that are uh, more stagnant? Um, there's less river water coming in and, you know, changes in nutrients availability to these habitats. So there are, I very much glossed over the different interactions that we will see, but that certainly nutrients, inputs of fresh water, inputs of solidity are things that we need to keep in mind as we're looking at changes in these habitats. Great. Um, and so again, if you have questions, uh, go ahead and, and type them in, and uh, we can also go back and, and uh, uh, refer back to other slides as well. Uh, we do have other questions coming in. Um, let's see here. We have... Uh, one from John, who says, in terms of a scale of the threat, what role does livestock grazing in California have on native fishes? Well, well livestock grazing um, is a pervasive factor in California's rangelands, and especially in mountain meadow systems. It does uh, degrade fish habitat. Um, but you know, it's, it's, it's really interesting. I, I'd like to see, it, it's, its effects tend to be localized. Uh, and it, there are relatively few native fishes, though, that it, it affects as a major issue. Uh, Becca may disagree with me on this. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's, it's clearly important in Shasta Valley, for example, uh, the grazing of cows in the, in the springs itself was probably the single biggest factor in degrading that habitat. You get the cows out. In Bengal, you had a restored system that's working extremely well. But um, in many parts uh, of the state, grazing is important. It's really important to manage it correctly. It's important to keep cows away from the streams as much as you can. Uh, but compared to so many other factors, like climate change, it's, it's, it's smaller. Mm -hmm. so. I'd like to add that we also um, it separated the impacts of grazing from associated effects such as yeah. water diversion or, or irrigation for pasture lands, mm -hmm. which clearly have a huge impact on flows, particularly in the summer. Uh, so that just something to also think about. Yeah. So just to clarify, that's the indirect effect of grazing, given that you're diverting water for that same purpose. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah I'm, I might add that, because Becca's comment reminded me of this, is that we've um, been working with the Department of Fish and Wildlife 
on the Fish Species and Special Concern Report, uh, in which we evaluate about 15 different environmental factors and their effects on fishes, including grazing is one of the effects that we evaluate independently of everything else. And uh, it's, it's always comes out as being something of middling importance, basically, uh, to species that occur in areas where grazing occurs. But it, there are always other things going on that tend to be worse. Uh, so we have a, a question here from Brian uh, talking about the potential for fish ladders. Um, and I guess with 70% of native fish habitat residing behind California dams, is it feasible to implement fish ladders at key dams and habitats? Uh, so what we've learned is that uh, fish ladders work well some of the time and usually for shorter periods of time that we would like. So uh, the, the issue that we have repeatedly in California is that we put these false hopes on ladders. Uh, they're usually built just for some monads, so that excludes, and, and some monads adults. So um, it's very tricky to design explain, a ladder. Explain that term. What was the term you just used? Um, Salmonids. I'm sorry. Salmonids are the group of fishes uh, that are salmon and steelhead and trout in, in California, uh, and well, in, in the world. But uh, that's how, <laughs> the context that I'm using them in. Um, and so it's very difficult to design a fish ladder or fish way that will facilitate passage from multiple species and multiple life stages. So what we find is that uh, fish ladders don't tend to be as effective as we would like in many of our systems. And also, I guess to add to that, that most California dams are too high. Yeah. Uh, you just simply can't build ladders over them unless you could. It would be enormously expensive and, for the reasons Becca, yeah. Becca mentioned, not very effective. Then you have the additional problem that once you get the fish over the dams, they have to find their way through these gigantic reservoirs where there's no, not much clue as to where the water's coming in. Uh, and then if they do find a stream to spawn in, those juveniles have to figure out how do you get out of your spawning stream, migrate out into the reservoir, then get through that reservoir and over a dam and go bounce stream so you can go out to sea. That's what's for, again, for salmon and steelhead primarily. But the problems are enormous to try to use ladders. Um, okay, so we have other questions coming in. Uh, what native, which native fishes are most likely to benefit from floodplain creation or management? And in particular, is there evidence steelhead benefit from floodplain re rearing? Uh, so, so there is some evidence that steelhead do move into floodplains. Um, they are not. Uh, they are not as obligated to use floodplains. Would you be okay with my yeah. saying that as say Chinook salmon? Uh, so they can use their, their rearing areas, but what we find is that they're probably just migrating through uh, and can do very well in other types of habitats. Yeah, yeah actually, uh, the other fishes that use floodplains for salmon are very important, split tail. Mm -hmm. And then we found other native fishes, as hitch and blackfish, will use floodplains as well. Um, but uh, I'll contradict, I guess, uh, Becca a little bit on this, is that uh, and this because this reflects the controversy that the floodplains to me are not very important steelhead. Mm -hmm. uh, I think as she said that they, they're mainly moving through. Uh, the studies that have been done on the yellow pies that bypass find very few steelhead. Um, of course, this may be partly because steelhead are in such bad shape in California, in the Central Valley anyway. Um, and uh, we don't really know how much they would use floodplains on North Coast streams, for example. So the, here's a, uh, a simple question. How will the Bay Delta Conservation Plan affect the long-term health of native fish in California? <laughs> I'm not going to get at me. Uh, that uh, is not an easy answer. No. Um, <laughs> we can say that we know the, the way things are going now is broken. We have a system that is not particularly hospitable to native fishes, and that the multiple actions on the, the Bay Delta Conservation Plan address a lot of those. The, the, the problem we're having in defining those specific actions is that there's so much uncertainty of, for instance, how these fishes will use floodplains, how they will use tidal marshes. Um, so we're, we have great hopes. Uh, I don't have a definitive answer. Yeah, I, I don't either. The Bay Delta Conservation Plan, you know, the theory behind it, the idea of separating uh, the, the water for human for export from the water that flows through the estuary, um, the theory behind it is basically sound, because uh, we, want, we want to restore, create a functioning estuary. And right now, it's, it's, you know, it's a perfectly good ecosystem out here. There's not particularly one that we want. 
at least the, the, those of us who are interested in native fishes want. So the question then becomes, uh, what kind of ecosystem do you want, and, and how, frankly, how well, much do you trust the people who are pulled and put this action into place, how much you trust that the actions can be modified as time goes on to benefit native fishes? Because really, the, the proposals through the Bay Delta Conservation Plans are grand experiments. Uh, you were assuming they were, were going to work, but we, in fact, we don't know that. Uh, so you, it, there's got to be a strong component in there of being willing to change our minds as time goes on. But it should be based on the idea, of what do we do that's good for native fish? And if it's not working for native fish, then we need to be able to change the way things are operated. And we're, as a society, tend not to be very flexible in doing those kind of things. Once we get a system in place that diverts a given amount of water, we want that water always to be there. And that's hard to do. Okay. Um, so, uh, uh, just a, I guess a comment here about the idea that there is different types of grazing, planned grazing systems, different than ambient unmanaged grazing systems, and I don't know if you have anything to say to that, but um, uh, we can go to the next one. The, uh, are there actions that can be taken to directly address warming water temperatures? And I guess this is the idea that can you, are there management practices, and the example they use is placing large woody debris in and around stream habitat to affect water temperatures, and what would that mean for the fish? Um, well, it, it, as, as Becca said that during the talk, it's going to be very site-specific. Uh, in some respects, sometimes this shading the streams more uh, is a big part of it. Uh, in the case of Blue Creek, for example, one of the nice things about it is that it's in the fog belt. We have to assume the fog's going to continue under climate change, uh, which helps keep temperatures down, and that's also a place then where you do everything you can to pitch, put structures in the streams, try to in, make sure you do have large trees along the riparian zone to shade it and so forth. Uh, uh, the other thing, of course, is to protect all those cold water sources that exist. Uh, many of them in these springs are highly exposed, they're drained and diverted. So any place that you have a good cold water source, i.e. a spring, as much as you can, keeping that water in the streams to provide uh, habitat for fish, uh, is, is what you want to be, want to do. Uh, Becca, do some others? Yeah, I, I think something that we tend to ignore, but it's usually important, is the sources from groundwater. Not just springs that come to the surface, but actual aquifers that may be feeding some other streams. Um, simply because we know as the flow becomes more limited, the um, temperatures can increase much more markedly in our surface streams. Yeah, I think part of this is to recognize that cold water is a precious resource of itself, not just water, but cold water, and that any place we have a source of cold water, we need to protect it uh, and to make sure that it keeps flowing, uh, and try to then try to then secondarily try to figure out ways to cool existing uh, waterways. Certainly, uh, fun, shading and things like this are going to make a difference, but we also have to recognize that in many areas, stream flows are going to be much lower in late summer than they are today. And that's going to make it very difficult uh, to keep temperatures cold. Okay. Uh, more, more questions coming in here. Lots of good questions. Uh, Bill says, has there been any consideration of how predicted changes in ocean climate productivity uh, and productivity may affect an Andromedus and estuarine uh, California fishes? That's a bank of questions. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I've been involved in looking at um, those impacts along with um, kind of freshwater impacts uh, on some monads in the Klamath River Basin. And what we find is that is it's very specific to not only uh, the population as far as location, but also the run. Um, so if you, I looked at historical uh, data sets from the 1980s to, to 2012 about, and the signature, depending on, on who you are, what fish you are, the signature of ocean conditions can either be very, um, uh, very much shaping the trends that you're fe that you're feeling as far as abundances, or it could be kind of a secondary um, effect. And so, yes, there is some work going on that is much more difficult to pinpoint. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm actually going to combine two questions here because um, they're somewhat related. So you mentioned prioritizing areas to preserve and restore these systems in the face of climate change. Um, do you also consider genetic diversity um, when you're thinking about prioritization, um, given the fact that, in this case, they're saying that that would um, be coincident with higher resiliency? 
Um, and then the second question, which is kind of a, also a bit of a prioritization question, is if the state were to adopt a five-tiered conservation strategy, will the rea realities of funding and time constraints force us to select winners and losers? That's the, <laughs> the best places and species uh, or endangered species. And then I'll, I'll save the last part of that question. Then. Wow. Yes and yes. Yeah. Um, so one of the yeah. rationale behind preserving all the habitats that we have across the state is that we recognize that each the conditions in each habitat shape the populations of fishes that are within them. And so ultimately, if you look at a meta population, so that the genetics of across all of the local populations, so all of the little groups that belong to the same species are being shaped by those environmental conditions, that is one way where you can foster higher genetic diversity. And so that is something for sure that we have in the back of our minds. Um, and yeah. now we're just faced with the reality of where, where we can do that. Yeah, but yeah, genetic diversity is, 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 is a worry uh, mm -hmm. because we do, do see all the time the, the effects of, uh, of narrowing in the gene pool and so forth. Um, I think that under these climate change scenarios that we have, uh, moving fish around to and and with, in, with genetic testing is going to be part of any conservation plan. We're going to have to, mm -hmm. uh, given the fact that pop, most populations of these fishes are going to be fragmented and they're more so than they already are from dams, that if we really want to keep these fish going for the long term, we have to have a system of uh, genetic for maintaining genetic diversity, that will probably mean a certain amount of moving fish. And that's really tricky how, to try to do right. How, how about this, um, this uh, subsequent related question about um, whether or not we're going to need to leave, uh, let some fish go in order to save others? You know, are there going to be, how, how, do you, how do you go about addressing which, which should be the priority areas? Well, it, it, yeah, which fish are winners or losers? And they are, that, I, unfortunately, I see that as happening. Um, it's already happening. It's already happening. Yeah, the Delta smelt versus winter run Chinook salmon this year um, is, is, a, is a, one of the things that, that has to be is being discussed. Um, and there's no easy answer for this because uh, we, can, we probably can't save anything, everything, uh, although you know, it's like the Delta smelt now has emergency populations in captivity. That may be one way we can at least save things temporarily. Um, but if we don't make up our minds, if given the limits of funding and everything else that's out there, if we don't set priorities, we're likely to have things being lost willy-nilly without our, our choosing making choices. Um, and I know nobody wants to make those choices. Nobody wants to engage in triage. But perhaps that's a conversation that needs to happen very seriously in the environmental community. Uh, is it because it's hard for me to envision, given all the effects of climate change on fishes, that every one of these uh, species uh, can be saved. And I don't like saying that at all, but that's the sort of conclusion you come to. Unless we really do adopt a major conservation strategy that we discussed. And, you know, I've been harping on this for, for every, my entire career, it seems. And I haven't seen, while well, things have gotten somewhat better, they've also gotten worse at the same time as our water's developed. So it's hard to be too optimistic that a real systematic statewide strategy will be developed. Uh, I can only hope. We have time for a couple more. Uh, we have uh, the issue of the role of hatcheries. In, in species conservation? Do you have any, any thoughts on that? Uh, some of the most heated conversations in the Moyle Lab have to do with hatcheries. Um, we do see a role, I see a role, in species con conservation. Um, my concern is always when we talk about large-scale hatcheries, um, because the trends that we're seeing it are that when you have large-scale hatcheries that go on for long periods of time, you can actually replace the fish that you have in the wild with fishes that are reared in hatcheries. And, and that is counterproductive because those fishes are less able to deal with changing environmental conditions, um, particularly those associated with climate change in both freshwater and in the ocean. Um, so I know Peter has proposed using kind of small conservation hatcheries as an alternative. You want yeah, well, I think this is on, not just me, but it's, it's a, um, actually a strategy that's used by some of the federal agencies even now on 
have, to have having some specialized hatcheries just for conservation. And there's talk about make, building one at Real Vista for the Delta, for example, where you would raise a bunch of the native fishes there uh, to have captive populations for emergency use or for re use in research. So I think hatcheries are part of the equ conservation equation, um, but they are always have to be tied to restoring fish to the wild and making sure that your hatcheries are not selecting over a long term for fish that are fit mainly for living in hatcheries and not fit for surviving in the wild. That's always got to be uh, the, uh, the basic goal behind these hatcheries that they're for for conserving wild fish and not for just conserving the fish. We have an interesting question here at the end. That, uh, it's referencing your cooperative report with CDFW uh, and wondering whether or not you're addressing the issue of, uh, I guess, alternative crops, uh, <laughs> including, including marijuana <coughs> and the effects that they might have on, on some of the North Coast streams and the fish in those streams. Uh, you know, it's really interesting because this is an issue I've been aware of for a long time, having worked in a number of these coastal watersheds, especially where, you know, as soon as you come across a piece of PVC part, you step, you stop sampling and and uh, leave. Um, as, and it's very clear that industrial marijuana cultivation, legal and illegal, uh, does divert water from streams and uh, especially in headwater streams where it's in short of supply. Uh, so we we talk about it a little bit, but it's not never anything that's a, a, a major thing. We talk about mainly because the data is not there. We don't know how how important it is. And from my observations of being in these watersheds, and Becca's I think has had the same experience. It's pretty pervasive in some areas. So it clearly can have uh, an effect on some monitors, especially species like coho salmon in, and steelhead in these North Coast streams. But why we don't know for sure. We need that's a place that obviously needs some good surveys to find out. Unfortunately, I think if we think of surveys where the fisheries biologists have to go out with armed guards. <laughs> Becky, uh, do you have anything you wanted to add? I think for some specific areas, we we discussed it um, and uh, rolled it into the category of either agriculture or water diversion. Yeah. Sort of how we would dealt with it. We didn't give it a specific line. Uh, you know, addressing just uh, cultivation and illegal cultivation. But we, we have begun to think about it. Again, like you just said, we just don't have the data. Great. So, uh, so I want to give you just a, a minute if you want to just sort of say what, what you hope uh, the folks that have tuned in today, what the, the takeaway message is, the big takeaway message uh, as it relates to your work on this subject. And if you have anything that is, uh, you mentioned a couple of reports that are under development, what people should be looking for over the next several months. Um, well, the basic message that I want to get across is that the freshwater ecosystems are the most endangered systems in California, uh, and climate change is making the situation worse. Uh, but the situation also is not hopeless. There's an awful lot we can do, and I think that uh, there's a lot of people who know this. We have a lot of expertise in the state, a lot of people who know how to protect and restore uh, freshwater systems, and I'd really like to be able to mobilize that force essentially to um, protect systems around California. Uh, the problem as usual is, is lack of funding for doing a lot of this basic work, for everything from basic research, just knowing what fish are where, to doing uh, protection and restoration of streams. Uh, nevertheless, uh, I always like to leave on, a, leave on a positive note that we can do this. Uh, we just have to have the will. Uh, our society basically seems to like native diversity, likes like native fishes in the sense people are proud of what California has to offer. Um, I would like to hope that this would stimulate lots of good conservation efforts in the future. Excellent. Becca, do you have a, anything to add? <laughs> cool. uh, this has been uh, excellent, and again, I really re do appreciate uh, the partnership with the Center for Watershed Sciences. Really greatly appreciate your uh, spending time today to, to go through these slides. Um, we will be posting these to our uh, website, the Policy Institute uh, website, and that's policyinstitute.ucdavis.edu. Uh, they'll be in our Informing Policy tab under uh, webinars. Um, and just please do look for future uh, webinars. Uh, we're going to be putting out more and more uh, in the coming uh, weeks and months. And I think, are we going to do a survey on this one? Uh, if you have ideas or if you're interested in other subjects, 
um, that we might be able to provide uh, interesting information and input into the policy process, uh, feel, please feel free to email me. Uh, my email is areggert, that's A-R-E-G-G-E-R-T, at ucdavis.edu. And with that, uh, have a great afternoon and, and a great weekend. Thanks.